John Hubbard will tell us about the Reformation Station. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It is a great privilege to be here. Uh, I'm not sure that it's as much of a privilege for, for you to understand it, uh, to hear this lecture, because uh, although I sort of thought I was going to manage to prove the main theorem, I failed. And uh, therefore, I can only present you an approach to the problem rather than an actual th theorem. But maybe during the course of the lecture, somebody will figure out how to prove it. In any case, uh, the mathematics that I'm going to be talking about is almost exactly 25 years old, as is so appropriate and was uh, invented by Adam uh, Epstein in 1991. So, the setting is the following. You start with the map F from S2 to S2, a branched map. And you have two subsets, A, B in S2, finite, such that B contains A union F of A union F of the set of critical points. Then You then get two maps from the Teichmüller space of the sphere with B marked to the Teichmüller space with A marked. Where IAB is the obvious map, the map which forgets the points of B minus A. And sigma sub F is the pullback map, or is induced by Beltrami forms. And Adam's deformation space, def of F A B, is the equalizer in other words, it is the set of tau in Teichmüller space modeled on B, such that I A B of tau is equal to sigma sub F of tau. Um, the reason why this space is interesting is it is universal for the property of parametrizing a family of maps, of rational maps, let's say that this is F of degree D. It's universal for parametrizing a family of rational maps which have exactly the properties that you can 
of f that you can see as a, as a map f from a to b. So an indiv let's say this way, there exists a map capital F from def of F A B cross the Riemann sphere to def of F A B cross the Riemann sphere commuting with the projections to def and two sections say cal A and calligraphic B uh, well actually these that isn't quite where the sections go from the sections go from to the same space. And I guess the way to say it is that f of tau a is equal to tau of tau a, uh, this is a little f, and this is a b. There, that's the way to say it. Uh, here on the left I have an a, a, yes. And perhaps I also want to say that uh, that the critical points of F are the points corresponding to the values of B. Part of this is that the critical values were put into the set, and I have to include that. <laughs> this is somebody who's sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> there are things in the back of the room. Well, I guess, I guess I can't say that what I usually say to my students when they're sitting at the back of the room and the front is empty. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I will try to write a little bigger. How do you explain what you're going to? Because I'm lost. So, I am defining a space, def of FAB at the moment, and I am trying to tell you why it's interesting. And the reason why it's interesting is because it has a certain universal property that it parametrizes families of rational functions of degree d, which the only thing that you can say about them is that they reflect the, the way f maps a to b. Maybe I should tell you a little bit about what A and B are supposed to be. Just a second. Typically, A will be some initial segment, initial segments written bigger, as there was a request, uh, of critical orbits and periodic cycles.
and B will typically be A union F of A y, uh, union those critical values that had not been included in uh, in A. You see, the question was from Andre, so I think it was from Andre, wasn't it? Which one? What what I was talking about? Yeah, that's right. yeah. okay. So so. Especially, you should think that A will have enough of various initial segment, segments to uh, remember, to, to see various um, critical coincidences, at various critical points mapped to the same point and such things. And that will be whatever you, you see within A of the, of the dynamics of F is going to be the case for all those capital F's which, uh, which you see here, they are going to have the same cycles, they're going to have the same, uh, they're going to have the same critical relations. Uh, having the same critical relations is reflected by this. This equation, f of tau in here, and a point which you should think of as being in A, but you, you can't really put it in A in here. You have to put it as a value of your section, because after all, these points are going to be moving in the Riemann sphere, and they have cross ratios. So you can't keep them fixed. That's why I'm putting sections to point out where the values of A are uh, at various tau's. So the image of your curly A is actually P1, not depth. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Is it possible to give a simple example of what depth is in a <laughs> Well, there's, a, there's going to be one really central example coming up immediately, which was undoubtedly the inspiration for all this, which is in the case where A equals B, this is exactly the setting of Thurston's theorem. And the points of the equalizer are precisely, and is precisely, rather than the plural, the post-critical point exhibiting it, which is Thurston equivalent to F. Maybe I should write that down. So Adam will confirm or not, but undoubtedly the inspiration was the case A equals B. Uh, this case is the case of Thurston's theorem. It's more desperation than inspiration, but this is the, this is the this was the sort of known case at the time. Yes. <laughs> the case. Yes. So that is exactly the set, setting of Thurston of of Thurston's theorem, and. Uh, except for the, the, the Lattes examples. Notice that if A equals B, then your, uh, your map is post-critically finite. Because it has to include all the critical values, and it has to be closed under F. And you might also be uh, marking a particular, a particular cycle, which is not actually part of Thurston's original theorem, but it requires no modifications of the proof to, 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 to include such things. Well, well, maybe I should talk about it. The theorem in that case says, 
either def of f a. Should I write a or b for the second one? Uh, there's a, only is a single point. In particular, non-empty. Let me write it differently. Non-empty. In which case, it is a single point. Or, and I guess I really should write it out in full detail, because I'm going to want to generalize it. I'm not on the first line. I'm not on the first line. <laughs> this line here. Or. Now, the or is the following. There exists a multicurve gamma on S2 minus A. Excuse me? If you raise a bit the board, then you can write comfortably. There exists a multicurve of gamma on S2 minus A such that every component of F inverse of gamma every component gamma uh, f every component there exists a multicurve such that for every gamma in gamma and every component of f inverse of gamma is homotopic in S2 minus A to an element of capital gamma or peripheral. Peripheral means that, it, that it's a simple closed curve, after all. So it separates some points from A from other points of A, and that none of those is empty or consists of a single point. In that case, there is a linear transformation f upper per gamma from r to the gamma to r to the gamma given as follows f upper gamma of the basis vector little gamma is equal to the sum over possible vectors delta in gamma sum over eta component of f inverse of gamma homotopic to 
delta of 1 over the degree of f mapping eta to gamma. And that should be viewed, this sum should be viewed as the coefficient of delta. OK, and this is not the world's most transparent definition. Um, and trying to generalize it to a, gray, to, to a more general setting is going to take a bit of doing. And then the claim is either the de deformation space is non-empty, in which case it consists of a single point, or there exists a multi-curve gamma, which is f invariant in this sense. And if you define this matrix, this is, this is really a linear transformation from a finite dimensional vector space with a basis to a finite dimensional vector space with a basis. So it has a matrix, and it is, uh, it's, a, it's a positive matrix, so it has a leading eigenvalue with leading eigenvalue lambda bigger than, bigger equal to 1. OK, so that's the theorem. That's Thurston's theorem. And there was an except for lattice examples. There are a few exceptional cases where A has only four points and where this is, does not work. OK, so this is the case A equals B. And if A is different from B, then uh, this def of F A B is some generalization of the set of, fi of the fixed point that uh, Thurston's theorem depends on. And the question is, what does def look like? And locally, Adam figured out just about everything. So Adam worked with F a rational map. <laughs> it is true that uh, he has it's a, he has considerable generalization. Let me let me pretend that he didn't make that comment. <laughs> but uh, but he you, he's quite right to point out that this can be worked in considerably greater generality than than what I am saying. This is actually an afterthought that you call it a bit more attention. <laughs> Shows how wise I was. Um, so maybe. After suggestions from me, according to Adam, <laughs> he worked with me, he, he focused a bit on, on the case where f is a rational function. In that case, <coughs> that particular f already is in, uh, in, in def so that it's non empty. What does the feature have to be in a type For what? Yeah, so. You have a type of this space? Um, so if you, and you have these sets A, B, and A, B sitting in the Riemann sphere, and I guess that the particular, the, the particular position of the points of B is a position which, is, for that particular map, is a position where i, a, b, and sigma sub f coincide. Because sigma sub f pulls back the complex structure, but it pulls back the complex structure to precisely the complex structure that you have anyway, since f is rational. And so the position is, so definitely this coincides with i, a, b. And you can just uh, forget the positions of the other point, uh, of the extra points. <coughs> So the answer to the next question is the standard structure at the point of the ideal space. 
So the information space is a space within the Teichmuller space. It's a subset of Teichmuller space. It's an analytic submanifold, as I'm about to say. It's an analytic submanifold of Teichmuller space whose, te whose cotangent space is quite easy to describe. And it's this description of the cotangent space to Teichmuller space which makes this transversality theory because it turns the description of whether various loci in the space of rational maps, how they intersect, whether they intersect, and whether the intersections are transversal, it turns that into qu algebraic questions about the existence of quadratic differentials with various properties. But in this case, it contains a standard conformal structure. So it's not in. <laughs> yes. 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 Let me see. The, 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 there was a surely inspiring, uh, inspiring comment saying that the standard, uh, the standard complex structure on P1 is in def. OK. <coughs> is non-empty. It contains, we will, P1, the positions of B in P1. And in that case, when it is not empty, uh, def of F A B is a complex submanifold. Teichmuller space modeled on B with cotangent bundle, or with cotangent space the co kernel of Nabla sub F mapping. the cotangent space to Teichmuller space of A at, at F. And this is equal to Q1 of P1 minus A. This is equal to Q1 of P1 minus B. Q upper 1 means the integrable quadratic differentials. Uh, integrable on the complement of a finite set means holomorphic off that compact, off that set, meromorphic on the whole sphere with at worst simple poles at the punctures. That's exactly what integrability corresponds to. You can easily see that any singularity more serious than a simple pole is non-integrable. Non <laughs> that, my good man, is the subject of this lecture. Or at least I'm hoping it will become so. That, my good man, is the other half of this lecture, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which I hope I will get to in due course. <laughs> and Nabla sub F. Q is equal to F lower star Q. Minus Q. Minus. You want it the opposite way? Yeah. Notice that they have the same co kernel either way. But um, I. I <coughs> OK.
Okay, this means uh, this def space is parametrizing a family of rational functions having specific properties, having a marked cycle, having a, uh, a various uh, critical relations, and so forth. And this it identifies the tangent space, or rather the cotangent space, to the space of such things and reduces the problem of how such loci in, in the space of rational functions, perhaps a bit decorated so that one is emphasizing some cycles or something, uh, how these, it reduces the problem of understanding the transversality of such intersections, the dimension of such, spa uh, such uh, sections and so forth, into an essentially algebraic question of trying to identify whether various spaces of quadratic differentials uh, are themselves transverse. Uh, and it has been, oh, let me see. So what more, do, what more was I trying to say? The direct image of Q is an operator which takes the, the, the quadratic differentials uh, here is Teichmuller space sub B, Teichmuller space sub A. On the level of cotangent spaces, the cotangent space is Q1 of X uh, of A, Q of P1 minus A, of P1 minus B. The co-derivative goes in that direction. And uh, F lower star is a, is a contracting map. So the identity minus a contracting map is injective. It being injective means that its transpose is surjective. And since its transpose is surjective, the, the locus defined by the equation is, uh, is smooth. And the dimension is the cardinality of B minus A. Notice that in the case A equals B, B minus A is 0. And in that case, you have something of dimension 0, which is indeed what Thurston's theorem says. OK, so essentially all of the analysis was done extremely well and extremely clearly by Adam years and years and years ago. And the global properties of this space, def FAB, have remained completely mysterious. And uh, what I'm hoping to, to explain, I was hoping to prove, but unfortunately I have not been able to push my proof all the way through, uh, what I would uh, hope to actually uh, come and, uh, but instead I'm going to just uh, um, describe a possible approach, which should answer all three of these questions. If it works. Um, so maybe I will begin by, by showing the technique that I want to use rather than, to, than illustrating, although the generalization of this 
is interesting also in the, day, the, general, the needed generalization of the Perron Frobenius theorem is kind of fun also. But maybe I'll start out with the techniques. So Thurston's, uh, Thurston's proof consists essentially of just iterating sigma f Well, there are two parts to it. There's an uh, existence part and a uniqueness part. The uniqueness part consists of saying the following. Here you have a sphere with various marked points. Maybe this is a very bad way of drawing a sphere with various marked points. Let me draw it rather like this. I have tried to, this is F. I'm supposing, that I'm proving uniqueness, that F is, I'm trying to prove the necessity of this criterion. And the necessity goes as follows. Supposing that you actually have a, uh, a point of your def FAB, which is a map from a sphere with various points marked to a sphere with various points marked. So there are extra points upstairs, which are the points of B that aren't in A. Aren't they v? And then you still have the ones which are in A, which I have represented as cusps. Choose a maximal collection of annuli around these curves. Now suppose that this one covers, this curve covers this one, and this one curve covers this one, perhaps with degree two, and this one with degree three. Then, um, I'm sorry, I want this one to go over to be that one. These two are homotopic to the same curve. There are two curves, homotopic with the same curve, but they're inverse images of different annuli. What? What was the last sentence? What was the last sentence? So, I want to look at two different annuli upstairs the, that cover various of the annuli downstairs, but which themselves in the complement of A are homotopic. In the complement of, of B, they are not homotopic. These annuli are some choice of annuli in the uh, homotopy classes of the curve gamma. Now, there may, so I, I drew two, and I'm thinking of them as, as fat as you can make them, and actually in complex analysis one can show that there is an, an precise meaning to as fat as you can make them. Then, these two curves in the complement of A 
are homotopic to this curve. And together, they have modulus. So if this one had modulus uh, A1, and that one has modulus A2, then these two together have 1 over the dig one uh, third of the modulus of A2. One half of the modulus of A1. Because when you take a double cover of, a modulus of an annulus, you divide the modulus by, by 2. Have I lost the audience? Have I lost Laura? No, OK. Now, you will notice that this is one entry of this matrix. And if the leading eigenvalue of this matrix is bigger than 1, this number is likely to be bigger than the original A1. But if I had made them as fat as I could to begin with, then I've got a contradiction. I've got a new system of annuli, which have bigger, ma which are, have more modulus together, due to the Grutsch uh, additivity property of uh, of annuli, than I had started out with. This is the necessity of the criterion. The existence. I'm, I am proving that if the, the, whole, the total, if the leading eigenvalue is greater or equal than 1, then upstairs you will have built fatter annuli, fatter multiplied by lambda, but even if lambda is 1, there's a little bit of loss in those inverse images, except for Latte's examples, where there is no loss. But in all other cases, there is loss in going to the uh, lifting, and if you had chosen them as fat as you could downstairs, then hey, you found new ones that are fatter than the fattest. And that's a contradiction. So you cannot have a multi curve such that this leading eigenvalue is greater or equal than 1. Okay. That isn't really the part that I want to talk about. The part that I want to talk about, about is the existence part. And the existence part consists of starting with some tau naught and then sigma sub f of tau naught equals tau 1, dot, 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 and uh, saying if the sequence converges, the sequence converges you have a fixed point of sigma sub f, which you will observe a fixed point is what we're looking for since i a b is the identity in the case where a equals b. And then Thurston proves it's, a, it's not something that I can tell, tell you right now because there's really too much to it. But Thurston proves that if this sequence diverges, then, then some curves on the complement of A have to get short. And then those curves that are short form a multi-curve. And then if you work at it hard enough, you can show that the, that the eigenvalue of that multi-curve has to be bigger than 1. Uh, that, that's the spirit of the proof. Now, in the setting of the deformation space, seeing is how now the map goes from one space to a different space, it is not obvious how you're going to find anything to iterate. And here is my suggestion as to what to iterate. It is based on the following idea that every tangent vector to the Teichmuller space to A lifts uniquely 
to the Teichmuller space of B to a vector of the same length. Uh, here you have Teichmuller space sub B. Here you have Teichmuller space sub A. Any tangent vector that you can draw a, to Teichmuller space sub, sub A and at any point in, so this is a point uh, tau. This is a vector C. Here is I sub AB inverse of tau. Here is A point X. The claim is that there exists a unique tangent vector to the Teichmuller space of B at X, which maps to, a maps to C with the same length. <coughs> now, this, as it turns out, is a generality. And depending on how general you want to be, you can just do generally uh, arbitrary Finsler spaces, or you can apply Slotkovsky's theorem and actually lift whole Teichmuller geodesics. In reality, it isn't just that you can lift tangent vectors. You can actually lift, uh, you can actually lift whole Teichmuller disks isometrically. But let me explain why you can lift just one vector. I, f I find it somehow a little bit clearer. Supposing that I have Banach spaces F1 contained in F2 contained in E with F1 and F2 closed subspaces of E. Then I have a map of E over F2 maps to E over F1. And if both of these spaces have the quotient norm, well, the unit ball for the quotient norm is just the unit image of the unit ball in E. That's how quotient metrics work. So any vector of length 1 here is, in the, is an image of a unit vector in E, and therefore maps to, lifts to a unit vector in E over F2. That shows that you can lift. It doesn't show that the lift is unique. And very likely, in infinite dimensional Teichmuller spaces, the lift is not unique. But in finite dimensional, infinite, finite dimensional Teichmuller spaces, the unit balls are strictly convex. And then, then the unique, uh, they are strictly convex because the dual norm is of class C1. It is a standard theorem of functional analysis that the unit ball of one Banach space is strictly convex if and only if the dual norm on the dual space is of class C1 except at the origin. It's uniformly convex, actually. And that may be something important. What? Uh, I'm doubtful. I'm doubtful. Don't forget that the, the t on the space of Beltrami forms, my space E, on the space of Beltrami forms, Beltrami forms is really a polydisc. It's a huge infinite little yeah, L, L infinity polydisc. And that's as far from strictly convex that's as you can get. Did I get it wrong? I can divide out by the, by the smaller by the smaller subspaces, and then I can divide out by the bigger subspace. And it from this. If the one is zero, it goes from the whole space to the quotient. I have it backwards. Yes. Okay. So as a result of this. <coughs> if I start here again with my Teichmuller space sub B and my Teichmuller space A, and I start with some point X here, I can project it to IAB of X, and I can project it 
to a sigma sub f of x. And then I can draw the uh, geodesic joining those two points in Teichmuller space. And then this entire geodesic can be lifted uniquely to a path of the same length in Teichmuller space sub b. And uh, under this, this one which, tangent, which lifts, lifts paths and therefore tangent vectors, uh, to, 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 it's, uh, it's being lifted under IAB. Uh, this is some geodesic gamma. And here is IAB inverse of gamma. And here is a point phi of x. It would be wonderful if phi were analytic, but I very much doubt it. Um, oh, surely not. Surely not. There isn't the hope. Surely not. Surely not. Uh, I do, I, that isn't really what I'm trying. What I would like to know is that the map capital phi is contracting. And I do not know that. But it's sort of contracting. Because if I start here at x0 and go to x1 and then apply phi sub f again and go to x2, then it is true that the distance between x1 and x2 is strictly less than the distance of x0 to x1. This orbit gets shorter and shorter. The, 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 the successive points of one orbit get closer and closer together. The reason for this is that sigma sub f is contracting. So how do I get to, to x2? Well, this guy is, projects back down to here. And I do sigma sub f to this line. It gives me a line down here, which is shorter. And that lifts to x2. And this path has the same length as that, which is shorter than this length which is the same as this length. So in some weak sense, which isn't quite the meaning of contracting, this map is contracting along one orbit. Successive points are always closer, to close, uh, closer together. Moreover, it is immediately obvious from this description that the fixed points of this map, capital Phi, are precisely def FAB. You start with a point x naught. You push it down by IAB. You push it down by sigma sub f of x. Let's suppose for a short while that you do not land on the same point. If you do, your point x naught was in def f to begin with. If, it is, if they aren't, there's a unique geodesic in Teichmuller space joining them. Lift that geodesic to a geodesic of the same length using the fact that vectors lift to, to vector, uniquely to vectors of the same length. <laughs> Lift it to a path of the same length. And wherever you get to, that's x1. That's phi sub f of x0. The fixed points of phi sub f are precisely def of f a b. Uh, you'll notice that this point x1 is going to be equal to x0 exactly if these two points coincide. OK, if I could prove that that IAB, OK, if I could prove that that IAB is contracting, if that map capital phi is contracting, I'd know everything. What? Um, weakly contracting, there's no contradiction. 
I wouldn't want to prove that it's strongly contracting, but weakly contracting does not at all contradict that there's a mathematical <laughs> Uh, the, the point is that I know that it t sends vectors like this to shorter vectors, but I do not know that it sends vectors like that to shorter vectors. At least I haven't been able to prove it. It is also true that this same construction defines a global vector field on Teichmuller space, or, uh, on Teichmuller space sub B, which consists of just taking the tangent vector in this path. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did you say that that vector goes to vector field exactly the same length? Which one? Well, the one you used for this path. Don't forget there's a sigma sub f in here. This vector goes to this vector, but, um, let me see, this, this, this point maps to here and here. These two points have a path that lists to a path of the same length. Now, if you apply sigma sub f to this path, it's shorter. Uh, nobody ever sees, sigma sub f is strictly contracting. It's shorter. That's going to lift isometrically to a path of the same length, but which will be shorter than this one. It is also true that there is a global vector field the, which are just the initial points of a, the, the direction in which this IAB is moving. And in fact, what I'm really writing here is Euler's method as applied to that vector field. But uh, this vector field again vanishes exactly on def. And it strikes me as extremely likely that solving the differential equation for that vector field is going to give you a contraction of Teichmuller space on to death, a, a deformation contraction, proving that uh, death is contractible when it is non-empty. OK, my time is up. Uh, so I'm going to uh, stop here. Unfortunately, I don't know how to prove these theorems. And I believe, moreover, that I am stepping on the toes of, uh, of Jeremy Kahn, uh, Tanya, and uh, Nikita, and I shouldn't step on, step on people's toes, but uh, since I did not actually succeed in proving the theorem, <laughs> you're only too welcome to, 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 to step on my toes instead. But I believe that they have a, a, a sketch of a proof, also a little bit imprecise, uh, of the of this, uh, theorem, the, of the, the contractibility of Teichmuller spaces. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Monsieur. Yes. So in, the beginning, so in the beginning, you mentioned that death has a universal property. And I agree with that in sentiment. And I've been wanting to say that myself for all oh, about 20 years. But every time I sit down to try to formulate the universal property, I find that I somehow would need to know already that death was connected with the universal property one formulated to possibly be true. And my recollection is that Grotendieck had exactly the same problem, which is why he required uh, the analytic input to the space to be connected or contractible perhaps in that case. So can you propose, this is universal whether this would be for appropriate suitably marked family over a connected space? Because if you don't say that. So the answer is that I, I do know how to do it, yes. and I'm not going to do it now live. Okay. But Grotendieck got around his difficulty by not marking families by homeomorphisms, but by marking families by sections of the covering space mm -hmm. whose connected components were the homotopy classes. And you would do the same thing here? And I would have to do the same he thing here, and then I would only get through the back door that it actually does correspond to the, to the universal property you think of because of the contra contractibility. Without the contractibility, it's not going to be true because the, uh, something, uh, any, any representable functor is a sheaf. Any representable functor is local. And this is not, it will not be local 
until I can, yeah. uh, until I get contractibility, so I'll have to localize. <laughs> and Grotendieck told us exactly <laughs> how to localize. That's an answer for you. I doubt that any, very many other people got any much out of it. <laughs> yes? Uh, uh, so if you could take a rabbit, which is non, not super rabbit, and then a uh, hyperbolic component of rabbit removed with uh, uh, a super crafting one should have a correct counterparty in this deformation space. I don't think it's the same deformation space. Based, uh, yeah, what's the question? I don't think that the Teichmuller space, the, that the deformation space ends up being the universal co covering space of the, no. of the center. Cases where it's only contained the other ones, I think. To contain your type A is a point, so the equalizer is everything. No, it's a, I'm taking non super crafting case. Oh, non super crafting case. Yeah. Okay, and B, like you mentioned, the initial segment of the But uh, I, I, you're going to get something a little bit different, which is uh, perhaps going to be the universal common space of the complement of the, the centers and the roots of all the components of the area. And then the universal common space of that. Nobody tells you that you can't go through values where the periodic, and you can't go through a value where the cycle of periodic bifurcates. <coughs> or even that, you'd have to think about. But uh, nobody, is say, nobody is saying that, that it has to stay attracted. There's no, there, there's no information put in about the uh, derivative of that cycle. Uh, it does contain this part. It should contain that. And it should be a universal cover of this component? Uh, no, it, well, it should contain a universal cover of the component. Uh, the, the, perhaps many, many copies of. <coughs> Surely many, many, many copies of. Because you, you're going to be able to walk without any hesitation <laughs> from, from here in the rabbit component I have to make the doodle too, after all. <laughs> Let me draw this a little big. And let me draw the, uh, the rabbit component. Here is the origin. You're going to be able to walk in deformation space from here to here, following your cycle of, uh, your cycle of length three. If you put the cycle of length three in your head, uh, uh, and perhaps nothing else. In fact, certainly not. Okay. Well, we have copy upstairs and next talk and. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.